What's the best explanation for why weight loss is not particularly difficult, but weight loss maintained is incredibly difficult? There's probably no single explanation. And um, I think that question of why is a tough one. Do we mean evolutionarily why? That is, what happened in evolution that got us to be what we are today that leads to that? Or is it biochemically and otherwise why that is one of the mechanisms involved? And I don't, from either point of view, I don't know all the answers. Um, from the evolutionary point of view, for a long time, the meme was, it's the thrifty gene hypothesis from James Neal, right? right? So the idea is that animals in general, and including and especially humans, throughout evolutionary history were on the brink of starvation. So anything you could do to preserve energy, you did. And anything you did that when given the opportunity to get more energy, eat as much as you can while you can, and then you get into this modern environment where there's, for practical purposes for most of us, unlimited consumable energy, you overconsume. I think that's simplistic for many, many reasons. First of all, as the lawyers say, objection that assumes facts, not in evidence. That is, it's not at all clear that humans have been on the brink of starvation throughout history. In fact, Robert Fogel, who won the Nobel Prize for looking at these old data going back to at least the 1700s of British naval recruits and other places, you see BMI sort of, on average, they're going up over the centuries, but there's a little fluctuation as things get better and worse in places. Second thing is, how does this account for pregnancy, right? Now, maybe now the latest data from John Speakman and colleagues in science with all the double they with water about three months ago, maybe suggest that during pregnancy, women's energy intakes don't need to go up that much, but they still go up. And so if humans have been reproducing for millennia, where did all that extra energy come from if we were all on the brink of starvation <laughs> all the time? And then the last thing I'll say is, Anybody who ever goes fishing knows that the idea that every animal is hungry all the time and is going to grab every bite of food you throw in front of it has never been fishing. <laughs> right? you, can, you, you can see that beautiful bass sitting in the clear water in front of you and you can dangle your worm or killie or whatever it is you've got and sometimes the fish just looks at you. So it's not at all clear that this is the case. Some animals do get obese when given unlimited food, some don't, both within and across species, there's mm -hmm. lots of differences. So that's that. Um, John Speakman came along and he said, I'm not sure I'm buying this whole idea. He said, I think it's freedom from predation. Back in history, we were prey. Then there was a certain point where we learned to use tools and hunt together. And we stopped being prey and we started being predators. And when we switched from being prey to predators, then we didn't need to hide in our burrows and eat the, lim the least we could because every time you came out of your burrow, you were potentially exposed to a predator. We could sort of walk around and eat kind of ad lib. And in that case, the genes that were being selected for that gave us satiety mechanisms that kept our weight down no longer were being selected for. It wasn't that nature was selecting for genes that made us fatter. It just wasn't selecting for genes that kept us thin. And, that, and then what happens is it's called drift. You know, mutations happen and things just drift. So he calls it the drifty hypothesis. And it's really less, it's, it's less about the thinness. The thinness was really a consequence of what the genes were probably selecting for, which presumably was lower appetite or something like that, right? Probably. And I think these things, it's not one, there's not one factor, right? We see this, for example, in the evolution of um, sexual reproduction, which is it's called the queen of questions in biology, right? Nobody can really figure out why do we have sexual reproduction when asexual reproduction seems so much more efficient from a genetic fitness point of view. And people have proposed different hypotheses for it, and no one seems to work mathematically. And what it may be is that it's only by putting them all together that it mathematically works. And it's just an inelegant solution. You see similar things in physics where it may be, you know, these beautiful, simple mathematical things may not hold up. You may just have to have ugly composite theories.
say a bit more about that. That's interesting. I've never heard the argument for, I, I, don't, I don't actually know much about asexual reproduction. I don't spend much time thinking about plants or other uh, life forms that, that, that do it. But w what's the argument for why we would be better off with asexual reproduction? Well, think about something like Daphnia, which is a species that can produce both sexually and asexually. There are many species like this, all the way up through some vertebrates. Um, and if, a, if an organism reproduces itself asexually, just sort of makes a copy of itself, think about what it's done is it's reproduced all of its genes. And so from the, the, Dave, from the Dawkins, the Richard Dawkins point of view, um, the selfish gene, those genes all got their way. Those genes all won. They got copied and genes that are good at getting copied will get copied again in the future, right? So you have more of those. That's how evolution works. Whereas if you reproduce sexually, you get another partner. Now, of course, this assumes other, this invites other questions like, well, why are there only two sexes? And um, why, in fact, have sexes at all? You could exchange DNA without having sexes, right? Bacteria do it through conjugation. But we'll put that aside for the moment. Say there are two sexes, male and female. They come together. They mix up their genetic material. The offspring has roughly 50% of the genetic material of one parent and 50% of the other. And now you, you only copied yourself one half. And so you didn't win as much as if you copied yourself entirely. So why would you ever switch to sexual reproduction? It's very inefficient from a genetic fitness point of view. Now you can hypothesize things. The most compelling hypothesis I've heard to me is the so-called Red Queen hypothesis, which is from Alice in the Looking Glass, where the Red Queen is running with Alice, and Alice at one point says, we don't seem to be getting anywhere. And the Red Queen says, oh, in this world, you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in place. And Alice says, oh, in my world, we run and we actually get somewhere. And so the Red Queen hypothesis is the idea that you, you keep running as fast as you can just to stay steady. Well, what does that mean is, well, as you're living a long time as a human, there are these microbes in you, and they're evolving much more rapidly because they have a much more shorter generation time. And as they evolve, they start to get good at getting past your defenses and your locks. They start developing keys to your locks. And you want to reset the locks. The way you reset the locks mm. is by getting a partner and mixing up your DNA with them. So the idea that it's a way of keeping up with the Joneses where the Joneses are the bacteria, the microbes in your body. That's, that's super elegant, right? Because if you think about it, if it was all asexual, we'd have a population of identical people. I mean, we would, for all intents and purposes, it'd be interesting to do the math on what it would look like but you might only have a few hundred thousand gene pools as opposed right. to billions. You'd have billions. much less diversity, yeah. much less diversity. So, the, so from a species point of view, if you believed in group selection, right, then you say, oh, right, it's good for the species. But then the, the smart evolutionary biologists come along and say, yeah, but that's group selection. It doesn't make sense. Selection occurs at the individual or gene level. You've got to explain how it makes sense for that individual, how it enhances their fitness or their genes fitness. So you say, oh, okay, well, if only half the genes get reproduced, then it's gotta be double the fitness level to break even. And that doesn't seem like it really holds up. So what people have said is, you know what? If you take a handful of things, which I can't explain them all right now, this is Muller's ratchet and there's this and that, and you take all of these things and you put them together, then maybe the math works. But it's very inelegant. It's not one nice little theory. And it's probably the same thing with people and evolution. So there was Neil with the thrifty gene, that is, you need to be selected to get food when you can. There's probably some truth to that. Maybe not everybody who's dying of starvation, but if you're not getting enough food, you may not be big enough to win the battle for mates in a polygynous physical combat mating system. Um, and so that may, that may select for wanting to eat more. You may not be, think of the Frisch hypothesis. You get too thin as a woman, you stop menstruating. So it may be that it's not that you die of starvation, but that your reproductive fitness goes down. 
On the other hand, the predation, the freedom for predation idea that John Speakman puts out is also legitimate. And there are yet others. Uh, Gary Beauchamp from uh, Monell Chemical Census Center has talked about the idea of the safety of food. Is it possible that if you're back in time and you're not eating out of a refrigerator in a modern, safe food supply like we have, you know, we love to insult our food supply. It's probably the safest food supply in history. Um, every time you eat something, you're exposing yourself potentially to microbes and toxins, not just predators. And if you eat less, you're less exposure. So there's, again, there's an optimization problem. Mm. But as you now have a safer food supply, you can relax that constraint a little bit. Um, you can even think about it socially. If, if I were in a species where I'm just out on my own, all right, if I'm, uh, you know, species that just eats eucalyptus leaves or something and doesn't depend on anything else, then maybe I can eat the last eucalyptus leaf. But if I'm a species that very much depends upon cooperative living, right? If I am so hungry all the time that I'm willing to try to kill you for the last bite of chicken and you're willing to try to kill me for the last bite of chicken, that's a bad situation, especially for me because you're a little bigger than me and did more martial arts. You know, so, so that's not good for fitness. It might be good to have satiety mechanisms just so we can preserve some social order. So after you and I each eat a little chicken, we can actually work together on building tools and engines and steam engines and airplanes and so on. <laughs> this is super fascinating. I, I, I could go down this path forever. Um, I think we'll come back to this next time we have dinner.